Okay, welcome to the next part on our class on variational methods for computer vision. Last time uh, we talked uh, about total variation and in particular we talked about uh, um, the more general definition of total variation. In the past and in a lot of papers you will find the total variation defined as uh, this uh, expression TV of U, so the gradient, the norm of the gradient integrated. That uh, definition has two uh, shortcomings. The first one is, since it is the norm here, it's not actually differentiable with respect to U. And so in terms of, you know, optimization, doing a gradient descent would require you, f to, first of all, to compute a gradient. Uh, the second shortcoming is that um, this definition does not apply to functions u that are not differentiable. And in the context of segmentation, in the context we're talking about here, what we want is a function u that basically encodes our segmentation, i.e. a function that is really binary, that for any x takes on values 0 here, or one here. And so the question is how can we, you know, make sense of total variation and define total variation in a way that it applies even to non-differentiable functions u, functions that are discontinuous, that have jumps. <coughs> And the, the idea uh, uh, to recapitulate is that you introduce so-called dual variables, a vector field xi, which essentially encodes the jumps or the discontinuities. This is a vector field that points uh, in the, uh, that is essentially orthogonal to the level line, so it points in the gradient direction of u and is a unit, uh, unit vector at least at the supremum. It, in general, it's just a 2D vector, but it's defined such that we are looking for a 2D vector which has lengths bounded by 1 and which maximizes the scalar product with the gradient. And of course, the solution is uh, a vector that points in direction that is parallel to the gradient, so points in the same direction, and then maximization means you choose the largest possible value and that is a unit a vector in that direction. And for that choice you see that this is actually the same as the norm of the gradient. Once you insert that in the definition in this, uh, in this form of the total variation, you can get xi times nabla u and then supremum over xi and as you can see the vector fields xi are vector fields, continuous differentiable vector fields uh, with C stands for compact support that means there's zero at the boundary of my domain there's always some domain omega here and then they are bounded by one so, so uh, length is no larger than one <coughs> And now the interesting thing is, so this is the same as this one, and the interesting thing is that uh, you can new, now do integration by parts and move the differential operator onto the other variable, onto the vector field xi. This is a very common trick in, in functional analysis to transfer the operator from one variable to the other. Uh, essentially integration by parts. And um, the interesting thing is that the expression that we have here is still valid for functions u that are not differentiable because we're not actually computing the derivative of u, we're only computing derivatives on these uh, auxiliary variables, on these dual variables. And so this definition that we have on the left here is the same as that one, except it also holds for non-differentiable functions. And so in that sense, this is a generalization of the total variation, which has two advantages over this more naive form. Firstly, it applies to non-differentiable functions. They just have to be integrable. And secondly, it is 
linear in U. So it's in particular differentiable with respect to U. So this uh, can be, you can compute derivatives of, of this with respect to U. And that means we can, uh, this is more amenable to optimization with gradient based techniques. And one such algorithm to optimize this with the gradient based techniques uh, is the primal dual algorithm I introduced uh, last time. And that I will show for this class of energy actually that the, this algorithm and its generalization in the subsequent journal paper applies to a very large class of convex optimization problems. Here we detail it for this particular functional, so a functional that uh, has one term that is linear in U and one which is this total variation term. So the regular riser. And essentially what, it, what we have to do, you can see it here, we have to minimize in the primal variable u and maximize in the dual variable. And we do that by techniques that you already know, namely the gradient descent. And since we have two sets of variables, the primal ones and the dual ones, it looks like two variables, but really u is a function. So, in fact, you have, once you implement it, you have a value of u for each pixel in your image. And you have two values, the vector field xi for each pixel as well. So there's actually, the dual variables increases drastically the number of variables that you have to store in your computer. So in terms of memory, you, you have to add a little bit here. But this is a common knowledge in, in optimization that sometimes optimization problems become simpler if you add auxiliary variables. And this is what we have here. Uh, by adding auxiliary variables, the total variation, which was non-differentiable, um, becomes actually differentiable, it's just bilinear in uh, a bilinear form in U and Xi, so it hardly gets simpler than that. But as I said, you have uh, additional variables and now what we do is we do a gradient descent in U and a gradient ascent in Xi. But of course U and Xi live in some optimization domain, U is functions that have values between 0 and 1, uh, and Xi are vector fields that are bounded by uh, norm 1, that where the norm is bounded by 1. And so we have to take, uh, to make sure in the gradient ascent on Xi, this is the gradient ascent on Xi, it's just, uh, uh, the, this is the negative gradient, the gradient that you add here uh, with respect to Xi. And, and then we back project this onto our set K. K, as, I, as you saw here, is the set of vector fields with norm bounded by one. Well, how these back projections work, I'll show in the next slide, is actually fairly straightforward. And so what we have is a simple uphill gradient ascent uh, uh, motion with a back projection onto our constraint set here, the ball in some sense, and uh, here we have a gradient descent on the primal variable. The primal variable u uh, uh, shows up in this term here with the divergence, and in this term with f, so that is the plus f here. And you see since this is linear in u, it's just f plus divergence this, and since we do a gradient descent, there's a minus here. And then a back projection onto the other convex set, the set of functions with values in the interval 0, 1. So that in itself is quite obvious, and in fact, if you alternate just these two, you also get a solution to the problem. And this is in fact how we started. The first was a somewhat naive primal dual implementation where we did a gradient descent in the primal and an ascent in the dual. Works fairly well. The issue is we were not able to prove that this actually converges to the optimum. And so one thing we came up with is this extrapolation step. 
<coughs> very much like in what you have in successive over relaxation uh, you the, the solution you compute for you 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 uh, extrapolate it so if this is the old solution uh, u n and this is the new solution u n plus one you go one step further and and you define this as u n plus one bar and this is in fact what we will use uh, in the update of the of the dual variable and it turns out and we were able to actually to prove this in the 2009 paper that this primal dual algorithm provably converges to a minimizer of this energy uh, actually you talk you don't say minimizer in this setting you would say a saddle point why is it a saddle point? Because we're minimizing in U and we're maximizing in Xi. So with respect to this expression here, we are determining a saddle point. So in the U variable, if you want, you have a minimum. And in the Xi variable, if the, the, you have a maximum. Of course, there's not just two variables, but many, but intuitively, in one set of variables you minimize, in the other you maximize. And so these... Uh, critical points are called saddle points for obvious reasons. <coughs> so this is the primal dual algorithm. As I said, it provably converges, of course, uh, uh, provided that you have sufficiently small step sizes. As I mentioned with the gradient descent, if you take two large step sizes, you get oscillations, it can even diverge. But if they're sufficiently small, then it works. And there's more that you can prove, and in fact my two co-authors, Pock and Chambol, went on to prove a number of additional facts on this algorithm, things like the convergence rate. First thing you want to know about an algorithm is that it actually finds the solution, converges to the solution. The next thing you want to know is how fast does it get to the solution. And it turns out that this algorithm has the provably best convergence rate among so-called first-order methods. That is, methods which only compute the gradient of the cost function and not any, any second-order Hessian or something like that. So there's a lot more theory than what I'm showing here, but for, for, for our purposes this is sufficient. It's a fairly simple algorithm to implement and we find it works extremely well, so we use it for a lot of the optimization problems we have. I mentioned these back projections onto convex sets last time already. I talked about it. In fact, I had min and max confused. Someone pointed this out last time. And so it should be min of this and max of that. To ver so idea, I'm often <clears throat> it's very simple to, to write these back projections in a somewhat explicit form. right? So you should be between 0 and 1. If it is between 0 and 1, then I don't need to do anything. If it's larger than 1, then I have to back project it, meaning to the nearest value in the domain, and that is 1. And if it's below 0, I have to uh, basically set it to 0. So it's actually, you know, if this is your interval and here is zero, here is one, this is the feasible set. If you're in here, fine. If you're here, then you have to back project here. And if you're here, then the back projection is there. And so this is what it is. I often find it slightly more <laughs> involved to write it in a simple, single line. That, uh, um, but that would be this one. And you can check this gives a value. Max u, uh, a zero u makes sure that it is not smaller than, that if, if u is less than zero, then you get zero. So it, 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 make, it basically assures this part of, of the interval. And min of one and whatever this is makes sure of the other side. The back projection of the dual variable is this one. So uh, you just divide by the length of the vector if it's larger than 1, and otherwise you divide by 1, meaning nothing. And so this gives you, this is a back projection onto the disk. Here's the disk, uh, 
and here's my xi, and so this gives me a back projection onto the disk. These are closed form back projections. If you are lucky, in, uh, as we are in this setting, you can compute the back projection in closed form. That facilitates the algorithm because that means this is easy and fast and uh, exact. Uh, in more complicated sets, you, uh, uh, con uh, functionals, you have uh, constraint sets for K or for C, which may be more difficult. We'll see an example in a second in which there are no closed form solutions, or at least often we're not aware. Uh, often it is difficult to, to find a closed form projection. If you can find it, that's always good. If not, there are standard techniques to impose constraints. And one of these you may have heard of before is the so-called Lagrange multipliers. Has anyone heard of that before? Oh, everyone. Very good. So this is a standard way. If you have optimization under constraints, you can impose constraints by so-called Lagrange multipliers. The difference to mention that is, is that in the optimization, the constraints essentially are added to your cost function. And so they are imposed iteratively, which means that upon convergence, the constraints are fulfilled, but during the iterations, they may not be exactly fulfilled. Whereas here, the, if, if the back projections can be done in closed forms, then in each iteration, you have a valid feasible configuration. So there are slight differences, but in practice, both uh, approaches work. Another strategy is uh, you can sometimes impose constraints by alternating simpler projections. If your constraint set is an intersection of two simple constraints that can be solved in closed form, then you can alternate. Sometimes we have cases like that as well. <coughs> Here are some examples of how you can use this uh, convex relaxation method that we've been talking about in the last sec uh, uh, section uh, for image segmentation. You remember the idea was is to separate foreground and background in a two-region segmentation case. Um, um, as I mentioned before, uh, a standard technique to do so is to compute the likelihood to observe a certain color in the foreground region or the background region. And so what this approach does, it's an interactive segmentation method that runs in real time. And what you do as a user is you just mark these scribbles, like you see here, red and blue. And then from these pixel locations that are marked in red here, the algorithm computes the color histogram for the object colors. So it assumes that whatever colors I have here are representative of my object. And whatever colors I have here are representative of my background. And then you determine, if this is a color space I, you determine some color histogram that says how likely is a certain color for the foreground object. And then similarly you, you compute I'll put it in the same graph. You compute another histogram P background of I. <clears throat> that says how likely is a certain background color. And then the function F that enters the functional, the, the F actually in here, is just the, neg the log likelihood ratio. Because it is I think we saw that before, f is minus log p outside plus log p inside or something like or or vice versa, it doesn't matter. <coughs> and so this likelihood ratio is uh, defines the data term. And what it does, you can see for yourself, this term here is positive if a given color i at that pixel is more likely for the object than for the background. Because if this is more likely for the object, then this 
quotient is larger than 1 and the logarithm is hence positive, otherwise it's negative. And so depending on what color I have, let's say I have a certain color here at a pixel, then I say for the background this is the likelihood, for the foreground this is the likelihood, so it's much more likely for the foreground, meaning this will be strongly uh, positive. And vice versa, other points, the background will be more likely. And, and so if I see, for example, a very white point, it's going to be more likely for the foreground. If I see a very green point, it's going to be more likely for the background. And respectively, the F will be either positive or negative. What is the effect of F being positive or negative? We can actually read it off here. We're trying to find a zero-one labeling by minimizing this energy. If F is positive, then the best choice for that pixel is to make U zero, because that gives me lower cost. Whereas if F is negative, at least that pixel will favor U being one, because then I decrease the energy. In addition, I have this regular riser, but just the data term by itself will favor a corresponding 0-1 labeling depending on the sign of F, depending on whether F is positive or negative. And the more positive F is, or the more negative, the more strongly that pixel will favor a certain label. In the extreme case, if F is 0, that would be if the foreground and background color likelihood are the same, then F is zero, in that case U is completely indifferent. It doesn't matter what you select for U, has no effect. And so this is what we see here, and in overall we can use this likelihood computed from these scribbles, we compute the color likelihood, and then we can assign to each pixel based on its color uh, that value of F. The assumption here, and this is important, is that somehow the pixels that I marked with my scribbles are really representative for your object or for the background. And what's interesting is you get this segmentation out just by marking these two uh, areas with red and blue. So you need a very minimal effort as a user to get a very nice pixel accurate segmentation of a, uh, of a fairly complex real-world object. And in fact, the community has been striving to develop techniques which make segmentation easy. And for example, if nowadays you buy, you buy something like uh, um, uh, Office from Microsoft, then a lot of these uh, um, programs already have interactive segmentation tools built in. For example, in, in the Microsoft uh, um, Office, uh, one of my collaborators developed an algorithm, uh, um, Karsten Rother, he developed an algorithm called GrabCut that allows you to draw a bounding box and then whatever object is in the bounding box will be segmented. And with Karsten we have heated debates. I believe this algorithm is better, of course, uh, than the grab cuts, but uh, it's a matter of opinion, essentially. Although we have benchmark results that show it's better. Um, but one thing that is interesting is you really only uh, get to un appreciate the results and understand the value if you know a little bit more of what's underlying. For example, you would say, oh, I, almost, I need to mark almost nothing here to get a good segmentation. But what's important, you see it here, is the blue scribble covers both the light green area and the dark green area. If you only scribble the light green area, the algorithm will not know that the dark green parts are also object. And since in terms of brightness, etc., they are not so different from the, the hooves here or the legs, if you scribble just the bright background, this is most likely going to be an uh, object in your final segmentation. But what's interesting is, even if the scribbles are not perfect, like here, you know, the, the foreground scribble goes halfway over the background, it still works. Why is that? 
Well, there is some green in here, and so the algorithm will incorrectly assume green has a certain probability for the object as well. But since there is more green here, it's almost all green, green will be still dominated by the background. So if you get a green pixel, the likelihood for background will be higher than the likelihood for foreground, sufficiently to get a nice s separation of object and background. One should say, these images, this is another aspect to mention, are actually quite easy to segment. And with the years you've seen images that are easy to segment and when we review papers uh, as authors we already know how hard some images to segment. For example, this image looks amazingly difficult for humans because it's very hard to see the object background boundary in these locations, but interestingly it's very easy for computers. I suspect because the object has its uh, relevant red component and the background has a more dominant green component. I don't know exactly, but you need very little scribbles, almost nothing to get the whole object segment. <coughs> There's more complicated examples. The good thing about this technique is it's real time. So, you, so it generates the segmentation while you're scribbling. And, and that means if you're not happy with the segmentation, let's say maybe in this example this part will be made part of the background, you just add a little blue scribble and it fixes things, it corrects things. So having a real-time capable algorithm is very useful for these interactive tools because the user gets an immediate feedback, is this a solution I want or not? And can correct accordingly. And so we use this a lot. In fact, sometimes for uh, a certain research applications, we need to separate objects from the background. For example, if we want to learn what are typical shapes of horses, you know, might be an interesting project, we need to separate lots of horses from the backgrounds. And then we can use this interactive tool. It makes it much faster. You have this segmentation in about a second or a fraction of a second. If you had to draw this all by hand, you would, you know, take forever. So this is a scenario where algorithms really make your life easier. Now I come to extending this to the multi-region case. And uh, interestingly, this is a, a much more difficult problem. As we showed in the earlier slides, the two-region segmentation, at least for fixed color models, for fixed data term, the two-region segmentation problem can be solved optimally. With this convex relaxation, we had the thresholding theorem that said if we solve the real-valued convex problem and then binarize the uh, resulting solution, we get an optimum of the original problem. And this result sparked a lot of activity in the community and people were at some point hoping that maybe everything could be solved optimally. And as you know, this is not the case. There are so-called NP-hard optimization problems where it's unlikely that we'll ever find a polynomial time solution. One of these classical NP-hard problems is the so-called POTS model problem. The POTS model is the extension of the icing model that we talked about for multiple labels. The icing model was this discrete lattice system that allowed just 0, 1 or plus 1, minus 1, two possible labels. The POTS model is the generalization where each node of a graph, let's say, can take one of, say, k values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever many. And already for three labels, it's NP-hard. So, it, it is a difficult problem. This is essentially the continuous analog of the POTS model. It's sometimes called the minimal partition problem in the community. Maybe I should write that down. Minimal partition. Partition problem, 
what we have is the same as before we have the data term fi in each region omega i and then we have the lengths of the boundary we had this before it's it's the mumford cha uh, type model with multiple regions from one through n <clears throat> and then the fi again would be the negative log likelihood if you want to do segmentation then you have a color likelihood for a color at a pixel and based on that likelihood for each region you have some data term that favors certain pixels based on their color more than other pixels let's say uh, one can convexify this multi-region approach as well and this is what we proposed to do in 2008 and in fact at that point it was the first convexification of the multi-region segmentation problem um, the way it works is exactly the same you introduce a binary indicator variable for each region and so if we want to partition say into three four five regions let's say this is omega one it's defined as u1 being one and u1 is zero elsewhere omega two is defined as u2 being one etc and so we have a constraint in fact each indicator variable can be zero or one but of course each pixel can only be in one of each regions and so as a consequence only one of each vi's for any pixel only one of them can be one and exactly one because each pixel should be in some region and so we have this constraint here that says the sum of all vi is one for each pixel and since these are binary one or zero the sum being one means one of them is one the others are zero and so this is one constraint we have to impose in the optimization when working with these binary indicator functions we have to make sure that we have a consistent labeling each pixel is part of one of these regions and so each for each x one of the indicator functions is one but otherwise we can have essentially any binary labeling and so in fact that vector of indicator functions v1 through vn let's call it v v here is in the space of bounded functions of bounded variation from omega to zero one and then the power of n means there's n such functions so these are functions that that take on two values and bv again means that their total variation is finite in practice it means the length of the boundary is finite because the total variation of an indicator function is nothing but the length of the binary of the so we i think we had that before if i have a function that is one here and zero elsewhere and this is the boundary c separating these two phases then the total variation of u is nothing but the length of that boundary and this is what we want to penalize here anyway and so uh, uh, bv basically means the length is finite <coughs> so this is a representation of that functional and you can see already things are getting simple once we introduce binary functions to represent geometry here even multiple regions functionals of this type which have somewhat nasty uh, terms like the length of a boundary of a set with respect to these indicator functions life is easy we just have the total variation in fact of vi and similarly here this is the data term it just is an integral over all of omega and then fi weighted by vi because vi is one if and only if the pixel is in the region so this is our problem <coughs> and if we look at the dependency on vi we already notice this is convex and this is convex so we're already pretty good problem of course is keep in mind the functions here are not convex they're binary valued that however in itself is a convex constraint 
It's a linear constraint. So we have the issue that they are binary valued, which means they're not convex, and what are we going to do? You can imagine we're going to relax and drop the binary constraint and allow real values. More specifically, what we could show, we, we introduce a primal dual formulation of this type, where you see very much we uh, the, this dual formulation of total variation, vi divergence pi, what I called xi i earlier is now called p, I apologize for the change of notation, but these are the dual variables, I should have called them xi, I guess. And so for each phase i, we have a dual variable pi associated with the primal variable vi. But there is one interesting aspect about this form reformulation, and that is that before we had pi bounded by 1, if you remember, in the total variation, now we have a generalization, namely we have a constraint that says not pi is bounded by 1, but the difference between pi and pj is bounded by 1. Intuitively, this constraint means that the, the boundary, the transition from region i to region j should be counted no more than 1. And in fact, in the supremum, it will be counted exactly 1, which means we really get exactly the boundary links. If you Recall, I think I talked about the the Chanvise model, and there was a uh, the Chanvise model or the level set formulation for the Mumford Cha model. There was a formulation for multiple regions. The problem of that formulation is it tends to overcount boundaries, and so in that model. You, you have regions 1, 2, 3, 4, let's say, and the transition from 1 to 2 will be counted 1, but in the Chanvise, the transition from 1 to 3 will actually be counted more than 1 will be counted 2, etc. Here, the nice thing about this model is that we have a correct representation in the sense that this, these two expressions are really equal. I should be honest, to prove that this expression equals that expression is very involved. I decided not to show this proof. It's in the papers, but uh, I skipped it here. The way this proof works, maybe I should at least comment on how it works. Sometimes it's not so important to get the whole proof, but to at least get some intuition of how the proof works. We want to show that this expression is the same as that one. What we can do is first we can show that this expression is smaller or equal to that expression. So it's always bounded by that expression. And secondly, we can show that, and this is actually more difficult to show, that in the supremum there exists a dual variable set such that they're actually equal. Not just lesser equal, but exactly equal. And this is a little bit more involved to show that. And so what we do is we have this primal dual formulation, again primal variables, dual variables, and as you see just like in the two region case, it's very simple, it's linear in Vi, Right, The whole thing is linear in Vi, so the gradient descent in Vi will be easy. And in the dual variables, it's also this term is also linear, plus a constant. Yeah. And so what we do is we minimize this expression here with respect to V, maximize with respect to P, and we relax in the in primal variable, we allow real values, just like in the two-region case, each vi can take on values between 0 and 1, provided that they sum up to 1. So this constraint still remains. And then we can apply the primal dual algorithm, very much the exact same algorithm I showed earlier, except now we have many primal variables. For each pixel we have uh, n primal variables and two n dual variables, because the p's are vector fields, so they have two components. 
So there's a lot of variables, which in particular means this is slightly more intense to compute and slightly more memory intense also. Meaning for two region segmentations, we typically have real-time performance less than a second. For n regions, depending on how large n is, the computation time goes up. In particular, it turns out this quadrat, this constraint, is quadratic in the number of dual variables. In the sorry, in the number of regions. Why is that? Because you have one such constraint for each pair i and j, and i and j can vary between one and n. So there's n squared order n squared such constraints, and they have to be enforced. And that makes the algorithm somewhat slower. There are uh, simpler relaxations that only need order n uh, constraints and are faster to implement, but they're not as accurate. The difficulty is here we want to solve this problem uh, with a convex a uh, representation, and it turns out there are many convex representations which lead to equality. They're not all the same. Uh, I think I might have examples, I'm not sure. So this, to my knowledge, is the, the best convex relaxation to date for this kind of problem. So the way this algorithm works for the multi-region, oh, one thing I should mention, oh, I have it here, yes. For the multi-region case, in contrast to the two-region case, there is no thresholding theorem. At least we are not aware of any. We tried very hard, but, you know, given that the multi-region case is NP-hard, it would be quite surprising if we found some optimality result here at least a hard optimality result. So you, you can, what we do is we solve the problem with real values for the VIs, and then we binarize the solution in the end. The way we do that is actually quite easy. For each pixel x, we check which VI is the largest, and that's going to be 1, and the others will be 0. So that's quite simple to do. But uh, this way we get a multi-region segmentation, but we can no longer prove that it is a, an optimum of the original problem. That is where we lose the optimality in this binarization step. As I said, relaxation and then binarization after all, relaxation, optimization and binarization is a very standard approach. Usually you lose optimality once you introduce the binary constraint afterwards. In the two-region case you still have optimality, there is a thresholding theorem that assures it. For the multi-region case we no longer have that theorem. And so as a consequence we cannot prove optimality, but what we can, what we can prove is uh, that um, the solutions are near optimal. Namely, what you can compute is you can compute the energy of the relaxed solution and minus the energy of your relaxed, uh, let's say, the thresholded version. In our notation it would be u relaxed larger theta or, or, or let's say thresholded. U thresholded. I'll just write u thresholded. And you compute you can compute that energy gap, i.e. you can compute how much does the energy increase once I binarize. I say thresholding, of course in the multi-region case I should say u binarized, binarized, more exactly. And the optimal binary solution in terms of energy is somewhere in between. If this is our energy scale, then the lowest possible energy we can get on this problem is the energy of the relaxed solution. Why? Because we're minimizing over a very large set of functions, including the binary ones. And then the thresholded solution, or the binarized solution, E binarized, U binarized, is up here. It's higher, typically the energy goes up. And the optimal, e, the optimal binary is somewhere in between. 
because this is a binary solution, so it's invariably larger or equal in terms of energy to the best binary solution. Yet the best binary solution cannot have an energy lower than the relaxed solution, because that is the best among all functions u. And so we have this so-called gap that we can compute here, let's call it delta, and we know that the true solution is at most delta away from the solution we computed. And so this is a nice result that we can get. Of course, whether it's nice or not depends somewhat on what the gap really is in practice. But what we find on all the segmentation examples that I'll show is that this gap is less than 5%, sometimes only 2 or 3%. And sometimes it's even zero. In that case, you know you have the optimum. So the nice thing is we cannot assure in general that we will be computing the optimum, but we know once we computed the solution how far we are from the optimum. And in practice we are sometimes optimal and often close to optimal. And the other nice thing that makes a very different, say, from the Chanvese level set approach is we know that the solution does not depend on the initialization. Because we're solving a convex problem, a single convex problem, and so we get an optimal solution. Uh, uh, we get a solution uh, that is independent of initialization, and as I said, within some computable bound of the optimum. As I said, it's unlikely that there is any such threshold theorem because the discrete form is NP-hard. Here are some more examples of this approach. This is um, multi-region segmentation, as I said. So this is the input image. The way we computed the segmentation here is usually you need this color likelihood, right? This one here. And I said in the interactive segmentation you can mark with scribbles. We'll see an example in a second and compute such a likelihood based on the scribbles. If you don't want interaction and you just want a fully unsupervised segmentation, what you can do is you can do a color clustering. So you take all the colors and cluster them, say with the k-means algorithm, and then use the cluster centers or the, the whole cluster of colors to compute this likelihood. And then this is what we did here, so some k-means clustering, and then based on it we computed a mean and a standard deviation and used that as a likelihood, and this is the result. And so you see we get multiple regions, I don't know, this is I think approximately 10 regions here. And this maybe 5 or so, I don't know. So you get approximations of such images with very few colors, that minimize or are approximate minimizers of this minimal partition problem. Uh, one comment, you see it here, uh, it took us four years from the technical report that we put online 2008 to actually getting the thing published in 2012. Partly we were still struggling with the optimality and we hoped to get somewhat better results on uh, you know, how good is the solution to get any uh, provably, uh, uh, um, uh, provable bounds, etc. Um, but this is not uncommon that something that is published in a journal in a certain time is actually much older. So I should say most of the results from the 2012 paper are already in the 2008 one. Here is some interesting results that you can generate with this approach. These are in-painting problems, so not segmentation, but similar. And this is not uncommon that a lot of vision problems are on a mathematical level related. At the first glance they may look different, but mathematically the difference is not large. The way these approaches work is as follows. You have some in-painting domain, say this gray circle here or here, and you want to fill it in with colors. 
and in this setting we allow three colors blue red and green and we say two things first the color should coincide on the boundary and secondly it should be minimizing this minimal partition model so the boundary links between red blue green should be minimal and one thing you may recall I mentioned that when I discuss the Mumford Cha model, you may recall one aspect about the Mumford Cha model is that for three regions meeting, uh, they only meet at 120 degree angles. And I mentioned last time that proving this is slightly involved. Um, um, intuitively it's not so difficult. The reason is that if, if you have any configuration that is not 120 degrees, then you reduce the cost by making it 120 degrees because the length is being reduced locally. Um, and so, whereas the data term is not really affected by tiny changes of this type. And in fact, what you see here is this is the, the solution we could compute with our algorithm, with this multi-region segmentation algorithm. So what we do in practice is we have this boundary constraint and then f is just zero. More specifically, f is essentially infinite at the respective boundary locations, assuring that here I really have red, green and blue. And in the interior, f is just zero, meaning inside all that acts is this regular riser. And so it's exactly the same model for f being infinite uh, on the boundary and zero inside, and then this regular riser we get such an in-painting uh, model. And what you see is we get an intersection that is almost perfectly the 120 degree angle. Next thing you can do is you can use, use do in painting for a four region case. This is what we show here. And now naively you would say, oh, maybe the four regions meet in a single point, like so, right? But in practice, and, and this you should remember also from the Mumford Cha discussion, uh, the Mumford Cha paper already showed there are no other intersections, either a boundary. Uh, a region uh, boundary hits the image domain boundary and that's going to happen at 90 degrees or if three regions meet then they meet at 120 degrees there are no other uh, um, junction points and so this case of four regions meeting in a single point is never going to happen it's not a minimizer of this energy because the boundary length is much too large and in fact what ends up being a minimizer is two triple junctions. And so this configuration in terms of the boundary length here is shorter than the four regions meeting in a single point. It's not surprising, right? Because here you have this boundary, you have that boundary, but you have four boundaries going to the interior, whereas in this configuration there's only a single boundary in here. So you save in terms of boundary lengths. And what's nice is our algorithm is able to compute this solution. It's slightly blurred, as you can see here and here. Um, once, so this, what I'm showing here, is the solution before thresholding, before binarization. And what I wanted to show is that even the relaxed solution is almost what we want. And so we are close to the optimum in that sense. In practice, you would then binarize the solution to get a hard, not a blurry transition, but a hard transition, red, green, white, blue. Um, and that would not be exactly the same. The energy would go up a little bit, but not much. <coughs> this is an extension of the multi-region segmentation and an application to interactive segmentation, a little bit like what I showed you in the two-region case, but there is an interesting generalization here. So. This is no longer with respect to the optimization. It actually uses the same partitioning algorithm as, as this approach here. But uh, the likelihoods, the data terms, are generalized. 
What we came up with is what we call space varying color distributions, right? Let's say you have an object like this one here, the fish, and you want to segment that fish. Then, as I said in the earlier approach, you would mark with your mouse uh, points that are uh, typical for the fish, colors that are representative of the fish. The difficulty of such objects and uh, many objects in our real world is that the color likelihood is not uniform, right? For example, here, yellow is very typical for the tail of the fish, but not for the rest of the fish. Whereas blue is very typical for this part, but not for the tail. In the previous approach, you would just learn the color likelihood based on these scribbles, but you completely ignore in which location of the image you encountered a certain color. And the interesting thing is, once you mark scribbles like here, you actually have that information. You know for each pixel not only what is its color, but you also know the location where you saw that color, where you observed the color. And so what we can do is, rather than just considering a color likelihood like this one, we can consider a color likelihood that varies with, with space, in space. And in fact, this is the, from the scribbles, this is the color distribution we get for different locations x, we get different likelihoods. So for some location x1, let's say here, we get a likelihood that is like this, and for the, some other location we get another likelihood. I think these are x1 and x2, yes. And so, what we can compute from this is how likely is a certain color given the location x. And I'm not going to revisit the whole Bayesian approach, but it turns out you can use, you can derive segmentation from a maximum a posteriori estimation approach, and you can show that this space dependency can be carried through the, the approach, meaning I can include as the data term at location x, that likelihood in a space-dependent way. And it will tell me that, uh, f you know, for any pixel x, if I have a color at that pixel, how likely is that color for the object, given that I found it at that location? And so whether x is here, 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 or here, makes a difference. The color likelihoods will adapt locally. And, and so we, we, we showed that if you retain this space dependency, you get drastically better segmentations. Here are some examples of the kinds of objects you can segment, uh, objects that even for humans are very difficult to segment. For example, this tiger here, it's very hard to say for a human where is the transition between object and background. The colors here may be quite similar to the colors there. And the, the darkness here may be quite similar to the respective colors in the background there. So if you just look at the color likelihoods independent of spatial location, object and background have very similar colors. In fact, they are almost designed to by nature. Animals have a tendency of developing camouflage. So they adapt in terms of the colors to the background, but what we can take into account here is that uh, a certain color, reddish color or other color, is typical for the tiger in a certain area and less typical in another area of the tiger or the background. And so even if you have strong illumination variations, like in the, in the background here, bright areas, dark areas, you can actually take these into account and, and keep track of what colors are how likely in, in a certain location. And not surprisingly, the whole approach is hardly any slower than the previous approach. Why is that? Because once we have computed this f at each pixel x, then the rest of the algorithm is exactly the same. I just plug fi into the segmentation approach and compute a solution. And the computation of these likelihoods in itself is not very time-intensive. 
it's just a couple of scribbles that are used to generate these uh, likelihoods. Of course, you can see we use slightly more scribbles because these images are drastically more difficult uh, than the previous ones. And still, even here, we get nice segmentation. So this algorithm as well takes, for a two-region case, less than a second. For a multi-region case, typically one, two, three, four seconds, depending on how many regions you want. Wow. Yeah, that image is off the last one, I apologize. Sorry about that, I think. Let me show you some. Some examples. So this is um, more examples of the segmentation approach. Here you see that even for you know real world, very complex real world scenes with reflections, etc., we get fairly nice segmentations of object and background. Here is an example of a segmentation of the birds. I think I compressed this image a little too much here, uh, but you see that we can separate even you know very difficult uh, foreground background separations with this method. <coughs> this is comparisons actually between the different approaches. Here, for example, if you take into account the color variation, you see you get a much better segmentation of this object as compared to the method without the, without the spatial adaptation that loses the head, loses the back here. In fact, it's not actually surprising if you don't take into account the space dependency of color likelihoods, you get segmentations that are what you would expect. You get those parts of the birds that have a coherent color that are bright, and the dark ones that are, are assigned to the background. Yeah. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about um, convex relaxations for now. We are coming to the next part. Welcome to the next chapter on variational methods for computer vision. This is chapter 10. It's on motion estimation and optical flow. And all, although this chapter is a little more advanced in terms of the kinds of functionals we'll be looking at, uh, little more difficult problems in many ways. It is actually an interesting chapter because it takes us back to the origins of variational methods in computer vision. There's, as you can see, many sections in this chapter. I added a lot of slides because optical flow and motion estimation is a very uh, well-studied and important problem in computer vision. The estimation of motion fields from image sequences is, as I said, important. It's one of the central problems in vision, um, and it, it's becoming more and more important. In fact, we are, you know, these days, as you know, swamped with images and videos. Uh, yeah, that used to be different. When, when image processing was started, digital image processing in the 70s and 80s, there were actually very few images around. And often, if you look at old papers, you know, they would take some image of the Lena, for example, and then you would have thousands of papers that just you know, ran algorithms on that one single image. Today we live in a different world where the internet just flows over with images and with videos, where images get larger and higher in resolution, cameras get better, they have faster frame rates, etc. And so we are really 
swamped with lots of images and in particular image sequences more and more, YouTube or other kinds of videos, and as a consequence the analysis of image sequences is becoming increasingly important. Another aspect uh, is that video contains a lot more information than still images. And I believe in particular humans use that temporal information quite frequently. For example, if you, it's much easier for humans to recognize people when they see them walking or moving than in a still image. Even detecting where is a person, if you get a black and white image and someone asks you find the people in this image, it's more difficult to localize people if they don't move. And as soon as things move, you see them, you detect them, and even segmentation, we'll, so, we'll see examples in, in this chapter, segmentation becomes easier if you have motion information. I have a little boy at home now, he's just two months old, and it's actually quite amazing. Children react extremely sensitively to motion. At this point, I have a feeling I don't really differ with respect to his favorite ball. Whether he sees my face or the ball doesn't seem to make a huge difference. Except, uh, the, what matters is which one moves. If the ball moves, he focuses on the ball. If my head moves, he focuses on my head. And so motion seems to be one of the earliest and driving cues to, to basically uh, uh, drive the visual system to select objects, to separate them, to focus on them, to uh, you know, uh, direct attention to. And motion is, is, is one of the most important cues for actually attention. Not surprising, right? I mean, th the reason why a tiger is dangerous is because it's moving. If it doesn't move, it's not going to harm me, right? And so even from an evolutionary point of view, we are better off, you know, focusing on things that move in our environment. And uh, interestingly, that aspect of motion, if you look at history of computer vision, it's been overlooked to some extent. People have spent so much effort devising algorithms for still images. And, uh, and often when it comes to videos, the way this is done and treated in vision is often you just run your still image algorithm on each image consecutively. But you're not, in some sense, exploiting all the information that there is in the temporal coherence of the video. You are essentially still working in a, in a still image scenario and just run it frame by frame. But the reason is, as I said, a historic one that, you know, there were not so many images. And even processing one image in the 70s or 80s was so computationally intense, you know, you would definitely not try to do 30 frames a second or so. But there are some applications of motion estimation techniques that are integrated in software. For example, there's a lot of software and tools for panorama generation where you take images and then it stitches a panorama. What you need to do is, of course, estimate how did the camera move from one to the next in order to stitch images properly. And there are techniques for video stabilization that essentially remove camera shakes so they subtract the motion of the camera and uh, uh, hallucinate a still image. <coughs> Mathematically, the problem of motion estimation is an ill-posed problem. Um, uh, we talked about ill-posed problems in the beginning of the class. It essentially means that it's not sufficiently specified to assure a unique solution. Typically, the assumption is that uh, we'll see actually later how we tackle the problem, but the assumption is typically that from one image to the next, corresponding points have the same intensity, the same brightness, or the same color. And uh, obviously, that assumption is not sufficient because from one image to the next, if you look at one pixel and say, Where are you in the next image? You know, just based on the color, there's typically thousands of pixels that all have a matching color. And so that in itself is not enough to, 
to determine the correspondence. And we'll see actually how one can get correspondence uh, uh, with additional assumptions. I already mentioned it, the optical flow or motion estimation problem is ultimately a problem of correspondence finding. And correspondence problems are some of the most challenging and most fascinating problems in computer vision and some of the most important problems. To give you some examples of correspondence finding and matching problems, disparity estimation from stereo images is an example. You are given two images taken from a different vantage point and you want to determine correspondence. This is a special case of motion estimation. The way it is special is that that disparity, that correspondence, is a 1D search problem, typically. If you take one image and another one, and if you, what's called, rectify the images, then the corresponding partner will be along a certain line for each of the pixels, and that makes it somewhat simpler. It's not going to be anywhere in the image, but there's a certain structure where they can be. Other examples are multimodal registration. This is an example that is common in medical imaging and more and more important. These days you can get yourself scanned with lots of different techniques. Computer tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, CT, PET, uh, um, can, and often you need to combine different uh, uh, sensor devices to get information about a certain organ because different structures appear differently in different sensors. Uh, and then what you often have is you acquired images from two different sensors and you need to put them into correspondence. You need to align them. This is essentially the same. So what I call motion estimation or optical flow estimation is in the medical community called registration. Just to tell you, there are different terms, different terminology, but ultimately they're the same problem. At least from a mathematical point of view, what you do, the functionals you minimize to do registration is essentially the same as what you do for what's called optical flow estimation. There are slight differences uh, in, in the types of functionals you use for registration. One difference, for example, is I said in, in matching images, the dominant assumption is brightness constancy. The assumption that the color of corresponding pixels or the brightness is the same. In multimodal registration, this is not a good assumption. Because as I said, certain structures will light up in PET and they will not light up in computer tomography and vice versa. And so the brightness associated with a certain uh, organ is different depending on what sensor you use. But there is a correspondence. And so there are more sophisticated correspondence approaches. For example, you can train your sensor and calibrate your sensor and learn which structures tend to get which brightness in in some modality and some other modality. And then you can use that as a data term to define correspondence. Another very different domain of correspondence finding that is related to optical flow and, and registration is shape matching. If you want to put uh, two 3D shapes, for example, into correspondence, it's a, it's a very difficult problem because you have lots of points defining the surfaces and each point can go somewhere on the other surface. All of these problems are actually quite fascinating and the mathematical framework underlying them is, is quite similar. And so this is why I decided to dedicate this chapter to correspondence problems. Here's some examples, before I go into details, some examples of interesting types of correspondence problems. This, for example, is, an, is a case where you see that motion is very central for humans. Even if you have a complete random pattern here, once things move, you can separate object and background, and you can see that there is a small box moving here. Um, why do you see that box? Clearly, 
you see it in the first and last frame, once the box stops, you don't see anything anymore. There's, you know, it's just a random colors. But as soon as things move in the same way, the human visual system is able to separate the differently moving structures. Here you can do it quite well, right? You see the box. This is an example that I generated where it's actually di more difficult, right? Even for a human, it's not obvious to see what's moving. What I did is I took a snapshot of, of the wallpaper. So there's essentially, it's not exactly constant color, but almost. If it was perfectly constant white, you wouldn't see anything. So there is a little bit of structural variation here as always in, in, in wallpaper, and it turns out this is sufficient to show you something is moving. Has anyone seen what's moving here? Which regions are moving? No. So this is an example and he, where you could try to devise an algorithm and say, find an algorithm that separates the differently moving regions, that finds those regions moving in one way and those moving in another way. And so I set out to do that. So here's the result. Uh, um, this is an algorithm I devised actually together with Alan Yuli. Uh, you might remember Yuli is from the Zhu Yuli region competition. We talked about that paper. He's a, a professor at UCLA and I was at UCLA at the time and I was working on this problem of uh, motion segmentation and so here is an initialization and this is an algorithm which is real-time capable it's very fast but i explicitly show, slowed it down to show you how it uh, how it works it iteratively separates the differently moving regions and and so what what is actually moving is these four letters ucla i put that because i you know i had to come up with something to encode into this. And now the interesting thing is now if you go back, once you know what's moving, you can actually see it. And so this is also interesting about the human visual system that it's for the first time you see something, it's hard to see what's going on, what's moving, but once you've seen the solution, you're much better off finding it again in, in an image. And so here again is how the algorithm works. As I said, it's slowed down drastically. Uh, this is easily real-time capable, so in real-time you can separate differently moving regions. And what's interesting is, is that even though this is another maybe interesting aspect about uh, the comment on um, current date computer vision, nowadays most vision algorithms will analyze images and videos by computing feature points. Most of you will be familiar with SIFT and other types of feature points. This is a perfect example of a video where there are no feature points because it's essentially constant gray. There's slight variations here and there, but there are no really clear visible features. And still, humans can see something, and computers can also see something. And the difference of these kinds of algorithms compared to feature-based techniques is that they're dense. These algorithms look at every color of every pixel and compute an optimal segmentation based on these colors. They don't select some subset of features beforehand. And so they also work in an absence of pronounced features. Here are some more examples. This is a, a very classical sequence called the flower garden sequence. What, what they did here is they filmed outside a, a window of a driving uh, car. And this is a, a common phenomenon. You can see it for yourself if you drive down the street and look sideways. What happens with a static camera, with a moving camera filming the scene, is that the structures with respect to the image plane move, like this tree from the, moves from the right to the left. <coughs> And what, what's characteristic about these scenes and these videos is that 
the structures move faster if they're more closer to the viewer and they move slower if they're further away from the viewer. And so one idea is that you can use this motion information to, uh, to analyze the structure of the image. For example, here we devised, this, it's actually more or less the same motion segmentation algorithm, but in a real-time capable implementation that runs at 30 frames a second, and it generates a partitioning of the image plane into differently moving regions. And so here, the color encodes the direction of motion, since everything moves in the same direction, it's all the same color. The brightness encodes the magnitude of motion. And what you see here is that the tree area moves very fast, and the background area here, it has a similar velocity, down here, and towards the background, it's getting slower and slower. And so you can really, in this scenario, assign a depth based on this on this uh, brightness. And you see that these points here are very far in the back, these are very close by, etc. Another example of motion, this is an interesting example of motion and transparency. So what you have here is three images from a video of two different motions superimposed. And the way you get that is by taking a video of a moving window. If a window moves and you see your reflection in the window, if you set the lighting properly, uh, properly means the lighting, say if you look outside, if the lighting inside is sufficiently bright and the lighting outside sufficiently dark, if it's balanced, then you get a scenario where you see both the inside and the outside superposed. And uh, and actually, if with a little, uh, you know, if you know the people, you can actually recognize them. The guy in front, that is Michael Black himself. And in fact, in the background, this is uh, Lee, his wife. And so you see the two of them superimposed in this, in this sequence. And I'm not actually sure what he did with this sequence, you know, but one thing you could try to do is separate the different motions and try to, you know, given this video, of superimposed motion, figure out what's outside, what's inside. Because this, once you open the door, things move differently, and based on the motion, you can try to separate both the structures. And I believe that might actually work fairly well. <coughs> okay, I'll stop here and we'll continue next time. Thank you.